afternoon. Does this work? It's my great pleasure to welcome you here at uh, Qatar Symposium. My name is Bert Hoffman and I'm the Chair of Epidemiology. The Qatar lecture has been given uh, once or twice a year since 1912. And the, under the terms of the bequest of John Clarence Cutter, who was a graduate of Harvard Medical School. It is the oldest lecture series, we think, in epidemiology and preventive medicine worldwide, and it has now always been presented under the auspices of the Department of Epidemiology, first as part of the medical school and since 1944 as part of the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, about 10 years ago, we started with the Cutter Symposia, and this is the eighth Cutter Symposium. Diet and disease cause or confounding. And we have three, may I say, eminent speakers today. I look very much forward to their talks, and I will introduce them the moment they come up. So I start with our first speaker, Richard Pito. Dr. Richard Pito is Emeritus Professor of Medical Statistics and Epidemiology at the University of Oxford. He is a member of the fellow, uh, fellow of the Royal Society since 1989, particularly because of his work on meta-analyses. Um, and he has worked in many capacities, many decades, may I say, first with Richard Dahl and later many others. Amongst others, is instigator of the UK Biobank and the China Kaduri Biobank. Richard, it's wonderful to have you here, and I invite you to give your talk, Quantifying Regression Dilution and Residual Confounding. Dr. Richard Pito. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. It's good. I'm glad this started in 1912. Actually, that was the year Richard Doll was born. It's also the year the Titanic sank. Um, right. Now, um, I was hoping this was going to be one of these screens where you could see what the next slide is going to be, but it isn't, so it'll just be random. That's the test of a speaker, you know, if they can, you know, give their talk reasonably if the slides come up in a random order. Um, okay, now, I, I've never given a talk which is going to have so little epidemiological data in it. I want to talk about statistical methodology. It's not normally what I do, and if I do talk about statistical methodology, nearly always I'd be trying to just give examples of results that use the methodology. <laughs> I do want to just talk about methodology. I think Walt says he's got lots and lots of data, so um, he'll, show you, he'll show you lots and lots of results. And I want to talk about a couple of problems that arise in, in epidemiology, particularly dietary epidemiology, environmental epidemiology, certainly study of air pollution and ambient air pollution, things like that, but everything basically except genetics, because in, in the genotype you can measure accurately, so you don't suffer from random errors in the genotype, and... You know, it's the same generally with, um, you know, sex and age, and well, it depends on the society, but, you know, age is often re so reliably known that when you standardise for age, you don't have to worry about random errors in it. But for lots of the things that we're looking at, you've got random errors in the explanatory factor, and you've got random errors in the confounding factors. And in both cases, these really do can distort the results so much you finish up with well, quantitatively wrong answers that are so quantitatively wrong, they almost finish up being qualitatively wrong. And I, I want to talk about these two things. Regression dilution has been given various different names. I mean, Donna's going to be talking this afternoon, and she gave it a diff different name when she was writing about it back in the 1990s. But it's the, the phenomenon has been known for decades. It's that if you measure something inaccurately, then it has less predictive power than it would have had if you'd measured it accurately. I mean, for example, I mean, if you know everybody's usual blood pressure, what their long-term blood pressure is, that'll be more reliably predictive of their heart attack rates and stroke rates. And if you just got a single measurement that could differ from the usual blood pressure by being above or below it temporarily. So it's that inaccurate measurements of something are less strongly predictive than accurate ones. And it's just purely random errors in assessing, in assessing exposure, systematically weak, and they bias, they dilute its explanatory power. So I say it's been talked about in many names, it's a well-recognized phenomenon, and I think it's generally understood. And nowadays, when we try to say, what's the relevance of blood pressure to stroke risk? What's the relevance of blood pressure to heart disease risk? We, we allow for it, we just we say, what's the relevance of usual blood pressure to stroke risk? And so then you finish up, yes, it's a two-fold difference for every 20 millimeters systolic. 
and that's because it's been corrected for regression dilution. Now the other one is it's very similar. It's very similar algebraically. There's a, there's almost going to be no algebra. In this. It's a statistical talk with virtually no algebra. Um, but it's the, it's the extent to which when you've got a confounding factor, the same thing happens that when you adjust for a confounding factor, then if it's inaccurately measured, then you'll under adjust for it to, to quite a surprising extent. And this has been recognized for ages. You know, residual confounding is an old phrase. It's been talked about for a long time. But we don't try and think about it quantitatively. We, we tend to just put a little note in the discussion, you know, where you, in the Lancet, the Lancet says you've got to have a paragraph in your discussion section about limitations of this study. We just put in a sentence saying limitations of this study, there might have been residual confounding. You know, we don't take it seriously. And I think it does need to be taken more seriously. And it's, it's more difficult because, whereas with regression dilution, there are ways of really allowing for it accurately. I mean, you can do it either by modeling or you can do it by looking at resurveys or various ways. I mean, it, but essentially, you can quantify it and you can allow for it. And, but with the regression dilution, it's much more hand-waving that you can say, OK, there is a problem here, and we know how much errors would be causing problems if we knew how big the errors were, but we don't. And so then people have to make judgments about it, and their judgments as to you know how much residual confounding there's likely to be or could well be, will differ. I mean, serious experts could finish up with different judgments here. So it's not it's not as satisfactory. But and for that reason, I think it's been underemphasized. So I want to talk about these two, but particularly the second one, because the first one's been discussed quite a lot anyway. But I'll be discussing regression dilution because the formulae, the reasons for it, lead very naturally into explaining the formulae and the reasons for um, the residual confounding. OK. Um, so again, purely random errors in assessing confounders are systematically weak in effect. I'm going to use um, in my talk um, two examples. Well, a sort of moderately strong correlation, which, which I'd say a 60% correlation, I'd call that moderately strong, or a strong correlation, which I'm going to give, talk about an 80% correlation as being a strong correlation. Um, so I'm just going to use those two particular examples. Um, so let's think of what happens if we've got moderately, you know, moderately strong correlation between the truth and strong correlate. Uh, anyway, we'll see. Okay, so regression dilution and residual confounding, both of them depend on this term R squared to try and help seek noise-free log relative risk. We want, we want some log relative risk for the treatment effect. We've got a relative risk that's the treatment effect of interest. We often do it by logistic regression, by Cox regression, which is getting basically log relative risk. And, you know, you may want, having got the log relative risk, you may want at the end to try and explain what that means in terms of absolute risks. But very often when we're playing around with statistics, we'll work in terms of log relative risks, even if we then want to try and translate them into, re into real world numbers of deaths. And the R in this thing, which I've put in red, I've tried to do it in red everywhere, um, is the correlation. Suppose we've got an explanatory factor. Well, there's a true value of that explanatory factor. And then there's the noisy value that we've actually got. For example, with blood pressure, the true value might be the usual blood pressure. The noisy value might be one measurement of the blood pressure, which is the usual blood pressure plus or minus random error. And um, then, obviously, the, a single measurement of blood pressure in a population, you measure a population in 10,000 people, and then there's 10,000 usual blood pressures. And there is some correlation between the measured blood pressure, the, tr the, the true blood pressure, that's the usual blood pressure, and the noisy blood pressure, which is your measurement of it. And so the correlation between the true value and the noisy value, that's what that term R is. And it, the reason that turns out to be so important is because, well, it's obvious why it's important, because it's the factor R squared that says how big is the effect of these errors going to be. It just, it's just algebraically, just the, the, the extent to which slopes get weakened depends on r squared obviously if r is one it doesn't get weakened at all but if r is 0.6 well r squared would be 0.36 so you'd only get about the third of the third of the slope you should get so this r squared will come up again and again all the way through this talk um, and so if we've got random errors in exposure and r is the correlation between the true and the noisy values of exposure the noisy one we know, the true one we don't know, then our log relative risk, 
you know, the, the answer we want is going to be only a fraction r squared of what it would have been if there hadn't been any noise. Okay, so residual confounding and random error in a confounder. Now, now we're talking about random error in a confounder, not random error in the exposure, but random error in some confounding factor we want to get rid of. Now, okay, so we've got a confounding factor. We've got our measurement of it, and then we've got the true value of it, but we don't know that true value. So if R is now the correlation between the true value and the noisy value of the confounder, then what's the effect of adjusting for that confounder going to be on our log relative risk? Well, it turns out that the change in the log relative risk will be only a factor R squared of what it ought to be. So, so you see, if you've and if the correlation between true and noisy information on about the confounder was only was sixty percent, which would generally be regarded as a moderately good correlation, then 0.6 squared is 0.36, it's about a third. It means that you'll jump, that when you adjust for that noisy, noisy measure of that confounder, your log RR will jump only a third as far as it should jump if you've been able to adjust for the, the true value of it. So this ratio, this ratio R squared of the noisy versus the true log linear slopes of risk versus confounder. So this is... It, it determines the effect of noise on the confounder adjustment. Okay. Now, the, the reason why... Sorry, I'll, I'll explain this last sentence a bit more. Um, why is it... Okay, so it, for regression dilution, we're all familiar with, or we could actually look it up pretty quickly if we weren't, um, the fact that if you've got a correlation R between the true value and the noisy value then your slope, the slope of blood pressure against, a uh, slope of risk, log risk against blood pressure, is going to be only R squared as steep as it ought to be. Now, we get to um, adjustment for a confounder. Well, the same thing is true if we were to plot um, risk versus the true value of the confounder, it would have such and such a slope. If we got a noisy value, it'll be shallower. And so when we adjust for that confounder, we've got a difference of something or other, in the, some particular difference in that, in that confounder between the treatment group and the exposed group, for example, if we've just got two groups. If we've got a certain difference between them, then when we correct for that confounder, instead of correcting for it by multiplying that difference by the true slope, we're going to multiply that difference by the shallow slope. So the change we make isn't going to be, the true, isn't going to be what it should be. It'll be a, a, a fraction R squared of what it should be. I'll just... I'm going to do a, a Mickey Mouse example. Also, I apologise to anybody who heard the seminar I gave here in um, the autumn because I'm going to use very much the same examples. I mean, they're plotted slightly different. Look at this. They're very much the same examples. It's the same story. But I, just, I, I really feel it, I found it really necessary to concentrate on methodology and trying to explain this to people. Okay, sorry, I've forgotten this was here. Hence, adjustment for a noise you can find. It makes log R jump only R squared of the way towards where it should jump if one were adjusting for the true confounder. That's the baseline on residual confounding. Um, so just give an example. On the left, I've got an example. This is just a computer was told to plot a bivariate normal distribution, so it's normally distributed things, and we've got a correlation between X and Y of 0.6, so 60% correlation. Um, and these are just bivariate, no, just normal random numbers with mean zero and standard deviation one, and this correlation between... Um, X and Y. So with R equals 0.6, R squared is 0.36, which is about a third. And that's when the real correction would be three times as big as the correction you actually see. Then on the right, I've got an example of a strong correlation of R equals 0.8. Um, and so here, R squared is going to be two thirds. And so your the correction will be two thirds of what it should be. So if you're going to have a certain correction for residual confounding, uh, but if you've got if you're correcting for a confounder, then you'll only need to make two thirds of the jump you should have made in log RR and the treatment effect, um, and so really you should jump fifty percent further. So on the left hand one, you should jump two hundred percent. On the left hand one, you should jump two hundred percent further. You should jump jump three times as far. In the right hand case, you should have jumped fifty percent further, one point five times as far. So really, these are 
and as you probably guessed, if r squared was a half, then your jump's only halfway towards where you ought to be. So this is just, in a sense, context. So summary, a noisily measured expansion factor will confound in fact are not perfectly correlated with the true value, and the true value is unknown if perfect knowledge isn't available. If R is the correlation between noise and true, then R squared determines directly how big the biases will be, either from reg regression dilution or from residual confounding. Same formula, um, except in the case of regression dilution, R is describing your ignorance about the expansion factor. In the case of residual confounding, it's describing your ignorance about the confounding factor. Okay, three examples, moderately strong. So uh, these are examples I've given, I think probably shouldn't say this again. Anyway, three examples where the correlation is 0 0.6, 0 0.8, or 1.0 noisy. And so we've got moderate, strong, or perfect correlation between noise and true. Regression dilution, the slope's going to be, if it's one third, two thirds, or one, then the slope, when you plot your graph of noisy blood pressure against stroke risk, it'll be only a third of what it should be or two-thirds of what it should be, or all of what it should be, depending on how close the correlation is between the usual blood pressure and your measurement of blood pressure and residual confounding, same thing. Um, it's the, when you adjust for it, then the change in log RR, the change in the treatment effect on adjusting for a noisy confounder will be either a third, two-thirds, or all of what it would have been without any noise. Okay, so hypothetical example. This is a hypothetical example I used last autumn just demonstrating effects of random noise on quantitative relationships between age and risk. Now, I've chosen age because it's just it's sort of an emotional. What's the relationship of age to risk? It's not something that anybody's got in, any investment in. If you get any particular question, you'll have people with different views on it. But you know, when we've got if we've got say an epidemiological study in which mortality doubles with age, well, okay, that's just a sort of fact. Unfortunately, speaking from the age of eighty. Um, Anyway, so what I'm going to do is take a sort of hypothetical study in which we've got people who are entering it when they're, say, exactly 35, 45, 55, 65, and so each of them will have a twofold difference in, rich, in risk. And then when we relate risk to true age, we'll get that steep line on a, on a log linear scale. We'll get a steep line, a nice straight line with risk doubling with each decade of age. And then because we got because we're introducing noise, then it get it gets made more shallow. And what mortality doubles per ten years of age, per ten years of true age, but a database demon gets into your database and randomly overwrites, adding or subtracting five years from each true age, altering it to the noisy age. So you don't know true age anymore, all you know is noisy age. And in this case, it just happens that this particular, you know, within a 10-year range, the effect of this will be produced R squared as a, is a half. So this is going to halve the log linear slope of risk on age, regression dilution. It's going to halve the effect of age adjustment when we try to adjust to age, leaving residual confounding by age, because age has been imperfectly measured now because of the d database demon. Okay, so here's a simple thing. So the, the text up there just says what I just said. So this is now just regression dilution. And we'll take a hypothetical population. We've got a study where half the people are 55 years old, half are 65 years old. The 65-year-olds have twice the mortality of 55-year-olds. So these little squares here, these little things that aren't red, um, those are the true ages. And when we plot risk against true age, we get risk 1 down at 55. We get risk 2 up at 65. And we plot a dotted line through them, and we get the true slope. Then the database demon comes and changes every age 55 at random into either 50 or 60. It changes every age of 65 at random into either 60 or 70. So now we want to plot risk against noisy age. So the risk at noisy age 50 is obvious, it's going to be 1. The risk at noisy age 70 is obvious, it's going to be 2. And the risk at noisy age 60... Well, half the ones who are 60 with noisy age 60 are low risk, half of them are high risk. And so their mean risk is 1.5. That's the mean risk at noisy age 60. So when we come to plot that on log scale, we get this line. Now, because it's on log scale, that 1.5 isn't exactly in between 1 and 2. 
if I'd been plotting on a non-nod scale, it would have been exactly in between. But it's intermediate between anyway. And so this line is going to be dominated by trying to get reasonably close to the value of one at age, noisy age 50 and two at noisy age 70. So we're getting a line which is mortality by true age, risk doubles every 10 years. Mortality by noisy age, risk approximately doubles in 20 years. And you know that you can fit it by Poisson regression. Actually, the slope of that is, you know, 0.98 of what it would have been if you. you know, it, 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 it obviously is going to be pretty well a straight line, pretty well to those two points. That one in the middle doesn't make much difference. So you've halved the slope by adding random error. So this is all the usual stuff. I've said this already about 10 times. In general, dilution ratio is going to be about R squared, where R is the correlation between true age and noisy age. In this example, R is 0.71, R squared is 0.5. Right, same sort of hypothetical setup, but over a wide range range. Now I'm going to go to age range 35 to 65, and I'm going to say that everybody who's 35 or 45 has got smooth skin. Everybody who's 55 or 65 has got wrinkly skin. Still mort mortality doubles with each decade of true age. Now, those with wrinkly skin are 20 years older than those with smooth skin. You know, those age with smooth skin are 35 or 45. Those with wrinkly skin are 55 or 65. So the wrinklies are 20 years older than the smoothies. And so they've got four times the mortality. The, so the unadjusted relative risk, if we were just trying to say, what's the association between wrinkly skin and age? We'd say they've got four times the relative risk of four. Um, so this is RR, this is the treatment effect we want. We want to know, being, is being wrinkly a bad thing? Well, they're 20 years old, but they've got four times the risk. But of course, if we adjust for true age, then that vanishes. I mean, you've just got the risk goes up 10 years per decade. It, it, sort of, it doubles every decade. So being 20 years old gives you four times the risk. And if you adjust for that, then the age-adjusted relative risk will be one. The effect will disappear. But again, a database demon is going to add plus or minus five years to each age, replacing each true age by a noisy age. So within each skin texture category, i.e. among the wrinklies and among the smoothies, in each of them, this is going to halve the log-linear slope of risk versus age. So basically, it's halving the effect of age within the wrinklies, and it's halving the effect of age within the smoothies. And so because the lines that we're fitting are only half as steep as they were, when we come to say, wait a minute, they're 20 years older, we've got to allow for the fact they're 20 years older. Well, they're 20 noisy years older as well. I mean, still, they're the average age of the risk of the smoothies is 40 and the average age of wrinklies is 60. So they're 20 years older, whether you measure in noisy age or ordinary age. And, but if you allow for the noisy age, according to relationship of noisy age to risk, then you're, that's only half as steep as it ought to be. So when you're adjusting that 20 year difference, you'll be adjusting, you'll only make half the change you should do. In other words, the log RR is gonna jump only halfway to where, where, towards where it should jump. And so in this case, the unadjusted RR is 4, the age-adjusted RR is 1. And if you go halfway from 4 to 1 on a log scale, then you finish up with a relative risk of 2. So change in log RR on adjustment to this 20-year difference is only half that on adjustment to the 20-year difference in true age. So the relative risk is going to change only from 4 to 2, instead of changing from 4 to 1, halfway on a log scale. So there is the whole picture. Here's the slope, the dotted line again, is the slope of risk versus true age. And there's the true age 35, 45, 55, 65. And then that's all the d demon did. It doesn't look as though it makes much difference, does it? Look, I mean, it's not that big a difference. But it's, it makes an, all the difference. See, because, again, when we try and fit a risk through the wrinklies, it goes from here, risk of 2 to, of noisy age 70, to risk of 1 at noisy age 50. And when we fit a straight line through the smoothies, it goes from noisy from risk 0.5 at noisy age 50 down to risk 0.25 at noisy age 30. So instead of this unadjusted R4 going to 1, again, mean risk is one same thing again. Um, it's exactly the same phenomenon, but we get this relationship. So each of these lines is only half as smooth as it should be. Adjusting for 20-year difference makes only half the difference it should make. And so we're left with a twofold difference, um, which is the vertical separation between these parallel lines. And in general, when you're adjusting, I mean, I've, I've, I've made this one easy because the correlation between noisy age and true age is exactly the same in the smoothies and in the wrinklies. 
But in general, if you're fitting a logistic regression model or a COPS model or anything like that, or if you're doing it multidimensionally, I mean, essentially, you, you're, you're basically trying to fit a pair of parallel lines that, which, what is the pair of parallel lines that'll best fit within the smoothies and within the wrinklies? You find that pair of parallel lines, you know, by fitting lots and lots of things simultaneously. Um, and then it's again going to be the vertical separation between those parallel lines. That'll be the edge adjusted thing. If those lines are too shallow, then you'll, you won't get rid of the effect. You'll only you'll take this a step only part way towards getting rid of it. Okay, so that's okay. A slight little detail. So just I'd note that when you're looking at these lines, the, the heavy line, the thick line among the wrinklies, it depends only on the relationship of true versus true versus noisy edge among the wrinklies and so the thin line in the smoothies depends only on the relationship between true edge and noisy edge in the smoothies so actually what we're looking at here in this case it's not the correlation coefficient it's the partial correlation coefficient so it's the partial correlation coefficient you know given whether you're wrinkly or smooth so it's r is the partial correlation within skin texture categories of true edge with noisy edge and again, R is 0 0.71 in both age group, in both smoothies and in wrinklies. So R squared again going to be 0 0.5. Okay, that's the end of the artificial thing. <coughs> I'll do a few real examples, but again, they'll be. Fair. Now, this one is the example of the Prospective Studies collaboration when about 20 years ago, Sarah Lington put got together data from 60 different prospective studies of blood pressure and heart disease, blood pressure and stroke. And this is just, I've taken from that just the line for um, people who are in their 60s, age 60 to 69 at the time of death. And so looking at coronary heart disease mortality versus usual systolic blood pressure among a million adults in 61 prospective studies. And that's the result she published. And as you can probably see, I mean, this is a doubling scale on the left on the y-axis and 20 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 20 millimeters systolic on and every 20 millimetres difference in systolic produces a doubling, a doubling of risk. Because it's been corrected, regression dilution, we'd have had the slope only two-thirds as steep as that if she'd just been trying to relate the blood pressure at baseline to risk. And the exact way that's used, I think, Donna, when you've done this, I mean, you were writing about this stuff back in the 1990s, and when you did it, you, you did it by modelling the way it was done. You can, you can assume that, you know, you've got similar distributions at the beginning and end, and then you can model the covariance between, and so on. But it, it's it, roughly the same. I prefer to just use the baseline, the baseline measurement just to categorise people. And then I use the, the follow-up um, survey to work out what the mean in each category is. But it basically, if they were... If it was all uniform, then, if, then if they'd give the same answer. There's two ways of getting the same answer. But if, there, if, there's, if it isn't normally distributed, if the variance is changing, then I think that this, this is a use the baseline survey just to try and categorise you know, what, what category you want to put people in, and then use the resurvey to just try and estimate the means in those categories. It's, it seems to be a bit more robust, but that's a detail. The main thing is you've got to do something about it, because it, it dilutes the strength of everything that you want to study and say is important. I mean, BMI is all right because BMI is there's so little variation in BMI that um, but, you know within people that um, the effects there, there are effects of regression dilution but they're not really of any very great importance. So you can just BMI is, is nice and easy. It's almost as easy as age to get right. And all those relationships with BMI. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons to believe that they're causal in um, populations where variation in adiposity is the chief thing driving variation in BMI. That's, anyway, so. This, that's the way it was done, but the main thing is it's got to be done somehow. It can't just be ignored, which it, it often was. I remember trying to persuade Jerry Stander to do this with blood pressure and with blood cholesterol, and he was all the time trying to argue how important these things were. And when I was saying, no, it's actually more important than you're saying it is, and he just wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't, couldn't go back and do this. You just, but I think what you've got to do, if you want to think about it, is start with what the truth is and work out what the effect of adding random error is, and then... Um, then that seems to be a much more easy way to explain it than starting off with this is what we observed and then trying to trying to persuade people to say, but actually the truth is this. So if you just start hypothetically, if you want to explain this, start with what's true and look at the effect of adding, adding you know, look at the effect of the database daemon. 
Okay, here's another one, correction for aggression dilution. Now, with smoking, you've got a different situation because with smoking, the people who say they're never smokers probably are never smokers. They'll be, they'll be absolutely negligibly affected by smoking. And so in the Million Women Studies, you categorise people as saying whether they're never smokers, light smokers, average smokers, heavy smokers, then, okay, you need to have a resurvey to work out where to plot the light smokers and the heavy smokers. And, you know, when you do your resurvey, you find the light smokers are smoking, those classified as light at baseline are smoking more than they said they were at baseline. And those classified as heavy at baseline are smoking less than they were doing at baseline. And those classified as middle at baseline are, on average, about the same. So the net effect of that is that this, this light smoker point moves up, this heavy smoker point moves, the, sorry, the light smoker point moves rightwards, the heavy smoker point moves leftwards, and, that, and this graph is what you get. But you've got um, the relative risk of one for the never smokers. The never smokers don't move, that really is where they are. So the baseline smoking questionnaire was used just to categorise women, but a resurvey was then used to estimate usual cigarette consumption per day in these baseline defined categories. So that's one where modelling wouldn't be as good. But you know, you, one can phrase it if you've got to put in more complicated models then. Okay. Um, I think, you know, people say, well, you're always saying smoking's so important. Well, I mean, look, now, the people who smoke here, there's the blue-collar workers. There, the, I mean, in Britain, it's the unemployed and the unskilled workers who smoke most. You know, if you want to say smoking's so important, you just can't compare smokers with non-smokers, and that's, that says how important smoking is. You know, you've got to allow for social class and things like that. Well, that's fair enough. It's true. So some of the mortality associated with smoking in Britain isn't actually caused by smoking, because nowadays the poor smoke more than the rich. And as an extreme example, um, smokers actually have about five times the likelihood of death from alcoholic liver disease that non-smokers have. That isn't because smoking is causing alcoholic liver disease. It's just because of residual confounding by smoking. Uh, by, by, well, by alcohol, sorry, by alcohol. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, and as noise affects, de you know, you can adjust for deprivation indices. In Britain, we've got a thing called the Townsend Deprivation Index. You look at somebody's postcode and it'll tell you whether they're high class or low class. And so you can adjust for the Townsend Deprivation Index, which sounds very technical, but it's actually a very inaccurate way of characterising whatever these personality things are that mean that smokers just behave differently in all sorts of ways from, from non-smokers. Um, and so we could adjust for it, but th then we're going to be under-adjusting for it. So if we could adjust for deprivation, we'd adjust, we'd lose more of the effect of smoking than we lose if we just adjust for, say, the Townsend Deprivation Index or Social Class or whatever it is, um, SES. And this is a particular example from the Million Women's Study again. If you take heart disease mortality in the Million Women's Study, just take smokers, focus on smokers and don't adjust for anything. They've got five times the risk of heart disease. Now, does that mean that smoking is actually producing a five-fold, well, a 400% increase in, in heart disease? No, because the, smoke, the, the smokers are disadvantaged in various ways, you know, low education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which are going to be associated with mortality from various other things. And so if you adjust for deprivation, then you'll get an 11% reduction in the log relative risk. 5.1 goes down to 4.3, which is a ratio in, the, in terms of log relative risk. So that's log 5.1 down to log 4.3.89. So that's, an 11, that's only an 11% reduction in log RR. Now, we know that that 11% reduction in log RR, it depends how well correlated our measure of deprivation is with whatever the key things that really matter are. And, you know, it's not going to be close. It's not going to be very good. I mean, maybe the, maybe the real, maybe R squared is, well, if R squared was, was a third, then we'd have gone only a third as far as we should have gone. So instead of taking an 11% reduction, we should have taken a 33% reduction. And actually, that's assuming that, you know, our deprivation indices have got a 60% correlation with where the essence of deprivation is. You know, might you... Does that mean the log RR, the change in log RR, might have been out three times as big? If it would be impossible to adjust for perfect data on all aspects of deprivation? I think yes. And a 33% reduction in log RR would have changed 5.1 into 3.0. 
it's still an important excess risk. You know, smokers have higher heart disease risks, partly because smoking causes death from heart disease. It's still an important excess risk, but it's less extreme than 4.3. So that's an example where I think it should change the interpretation. It doesn't take away the effect, but it reduces it. You jump, you know, R squared of the way towards where you should have jumped. And that's if the real jump, you know, if we were jumping only a third of the way towards we should have jumped, well, 11% is a third of the way towards 33. Again, correlation between what's known as deprivation of truly relevant characteristics might well be only moderate. For example, 0.6 of giving R squared is one, is one third, and that would yield a 33% reduction if you allow for that. So, and this is obviously relevant to diets, because diets correlate with lots and lots of things. So residual confounding after noisy adjustment for smoking. I'll take the example of high or fro fruit lint intake versus lung cancer. I'm taking this one for two reasons. This is an Richard Dole collaboration. Firstly, because it's one where nobody's really interested in thinking about whether these things are causal, so I can use it just in methodology. Um, people aren't saying, is smoking really protect you against lung cancer anymore? They used to, but they're not doing it nearly as much now. Now, very notably, smokers don't eat much fruit. I mean, in the Million Women's Study, if you just split people into low, low fruit and high fruit intake, then the low fruit intake, 24% of the women were smokers, high fruit intake, it was 6%. Well, obviously, that's going to produce an association between death from lung cancer and low fruit intake. So, so we've got this strong inverse association of um, fruit intake with smoking, and so we're going to get a strong inverse in association with lung cancer. And this inverse association, because we, even smoking, we can't characterise perfectly. We do it pretty well. You can do it better than a lot of things. But even, even then, the information from a questionnaire about smoking isn't going to be a perfect measure of the you know, carcinogenic insult that person has had over the previous decades or even in future decades. I mean, because you know, you're, when you're doing a follow-up study, then you'll be asking how well did my baseline survey predict what was going to be happening during follow-up, despite there being no effect in never smokers. So here's the results, residual confounding after noisy adjustment. If you just take everybody, adjust for age and sex, and don't adjust for smoking, and you finish up with lung cancer, you know, fruit intake, 0.44, you know, fruit intake seems to be protecting against smoking, against lung cancer. Then you adjust for smoking and deprivation. That changes it to 0.82. But among the never smokers, there's no association. And this 0.82, you see, the unadjusted log RR is minus 0.8. The adjusted log RR is minus 0.2. And so that's a 75% change in log RR. You know, it's what you'd get if there was an 87% correlation between you know, your best estimate of how much people have been hit from, from your baseline questionnaire and the real exposure. But you see, but this is still at 10 standard errors away from zero with a p-value of 10 to the minus 30. And you only need to be five standard errors away from zero to discover the Higgs boson. Okay, so just Richard Dog Consortium, this is very brief now. Um, in 2021, people doing big prospective studies agreed to share pre specified analyses, the questionnaire based epidemiological data on dietary factors, heart disease, and stroke for careful collaborative review that were designed to avoid or limit it by reverse causality. Well, be pros prospective studies for a start, you can't trust retrospective ones. Publication bias, well, try and get all the big studies and predefined this imprecision of baseline dietary information, which means that every dietary factor, you're underestimating the strength of its association with risk. And then unmeasured and or residual confounding, that just, it's still the most difficult issue to address. In fact, the difficulty of this is the reason I'm here now. Okay, well, actually, I'm going to skip over this because I showed this this autumn. What do you do to avoid reverse causality? Prospective studies admit people who've already got disease and admit the first three or so years of follow-up. Okay, well, that's done. Limiting events of publication by specified the which studies to go for. Well, your tw the 21 biggest, 20 of the 21 shared data. All those were diet questionnaires on more than 100,000 by 2010. Specified set of exposures, specified set of outcomes, and then just do those exposure outcome pairs from those studies and no others. That's been done. Limiting imprecise baseline data. Well, see how well the baseline questionnaires predicted what's seen at follow up, and then limiting residual confounding. That's the difficult problem. We've done the analyses, people the people who've done the analyses, they sent them in, and we're trying to display the data in ways which will make people who want to argue that it is residual confounding or could be residual confounding, 
feel that their viewpoint is, can be accommodated, but also that those who feel that it couldn't be, that they basically want to try and make the data transparently available. And we're, we're getting there. It's been much more difficult than I thought it would be. We're getting there. And I, I'd hope we'll have a manuscript to circulate within a month or two. Um, okay, that's it. Summary, well, this is what I've already said. R and R squared. A noisily measured expansionary factor isn't perfectly correlated. And if the correlation between noise and true is R, then R squared determines how big, big the biases are going to be. And it, the only little if the R is comparing two exposure groups, then R is the partial correlation coefficient within those exposures. But it's the same formula, same idea, same reason. Um, no, I've done that. I've done that. So just one last slide um, as a sort of perspective on this. I don't think I've ever given a talk on epidemiology with so little epidemiological data in it. It's just talking about methods, because I do think we need to take this more seriously. And also, if people are talking about causal inference and they want to say, OK, we're going to adjust for this and take that and take that arrow out, well, adjusting for things doesn't take those arrows out. It just takes part of it out and still leaves part of it there. And so it, it's actually, it, it makes a lot of things a lot more difficult. As a perspective, the, world, the probability of death before 50 is if we miss this sort of blip due to COVID, that's only 20 million deaths, been going down for half a century. And the same is true of the probability that a 50-year-old is going to die before 70. And that's gone down by about a third since 1970. It's going up in some countries, it's going up in America, but it's, it's going down worldwide and it's going down in many countries. Now, you know, what is eaten and how much is eaten affects adiposity, diabetes, blood pressure, blood lipids, definitely these are causal. These and tobacco are the main avoidable causes of non-communicable disease mortality. So dietary factors and smoking, particularly for vascular disease and renal disease and um, diabetes. And studies of the effects of particular dietary factors on these intermediate causes, trying to work out what are the dietary things that really are going to affect, um, particularly BMI, for example, in populations where you've got a lot of acid, adiposity or obesity. What can you do in practice? It may be that this will be more reliably informative about how to modify BMI and therefore how to modify disease, disease rates than try to go straight from dietary questionnaires to cause-specific mortality. In fact, both things are going to be tried. And it may be that trying to go to some intermediate thing will produce really more, you know, for example, the relevance of salt to systolic blood pressure, the relevance of types of fat to, um, to LDL cholesterol. So it may be that these things will be more informative than trying directly to link diet questionnaires to cause specific mortality. I suspect they will be, but really I think both both approaches can and will, both approaches should and will be pursued. That's my last one. Just regression dilution residual finding should be considered quantitatively in dietary and environmental epidemiology, particularly the epidemiology of air, ambient air pollution and the claims on, of effects on human health there along with the effect that I measured and found in those causality publication, but I saw the obvious things. It just, you know, when we're looking at it, just smoking. When I was talking to Richard Doll when he was lying dying in hospital, he said, God, we had it easy, didn't we, just looking at smoking. It was just so much easier. And yeah, he did. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. We will have a general discussion after the pre talk, but perhaps. One or two questions now about uh, Dr. Peter's talk. I don't actually have a doctorate. Anyone. Anybody want to disagree? <laughs> no. Okay, let's go on to the discussion. Good. Then we do it in the general discussion. That brings me to, yeah, thank you very much. That brings me to our second speaker, Donna Spiegelman, the Susan Dwight Bliss Professor of Biostatistics at Yale University. Um, but before that, very much, of course, here at our Harvard School of Public Health, even in the Department of Epidemiology, working on the nurses' studies. Uh, and five years ago, you went to Yale to become the director of the Center for Methods, Implementation, and Prevention Science. It's wonderful to have you back here, Donna. Please give your talk on the limits of confounding the boundlessness of measurement error. Dr. Donna Spiegelman. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. I taught my first class as a professor or as an assistant professor in this room 
probably in 1993 or something like that, Epi 202. And here I am again um, presenting some of the results of the research I've worked on over these many years. So um, what I'm going to do, uh, time permitting, is I'm going to talk about uh, the, what might be the causes of the large variations in space and time of major chronic diseases. That's related to the underlying question of the symposium, um, diet and disease, confounding or cause. So the first question is, are there big causes we have to explain? Um, and I want to establish that first. Then uh, my next point is why the associations reported from epidemiologic data are unlikely to be due to confounding or at least address the extent to that. And then why the associations uh, reported from epidemiologic data are underestimates of the true associations. And then where might we go from here? So um, if we have to think about um, diet and health, we, we want to know, first of all, what's the big question here about causes of disease and health that um, we might be wanting to explain. So this is actually from uh, Richard's 1981 book, The Causes of Cancer, which I studied very diligently in preparation for my epi qualifying exams many years ago. <laughs> um, and what we see here is, and even though the data are historic, um, I, I think it's actually fantastic that we have all this historic data because we can really get a good look at certain things that maybe are a little bit more blurred now as the world is getting more and more similar. But um, in this first panel, um, we're comparing cancer incidence rates for Ibad in Nigeria compared to blacks and whites in the United States. Um, it was around 1976, and we can see that um, most cancer rates um, were relatively low in Nigeria and that blacks and whites in the United States had um, comparably very high um, rates, including um, for prostate cancer, which is known to be a cancer that uh, black males are at very high risk of. And so we see very, very strong differences. This is across, um, this is across space or across countries among people who, to some extent, have very, um, uh, lots of overlapping genetic backgrounds. And then here we have a similar type of table from Richard's book, um, looking at um, cancer rates in Japan and then among Jap Japanese and Caucasians in Hawaii. I think most of the Japanese there at that point, 1976, would be maybe second generation Japanese. So again, we see um, very, very different patterns between the rates in Japan and those among uh, Japanese, um, maybe second ge generation Japanese Americans in Hawaii who have very similar rates um, to those white um, Hawaiians. And we're talking about like three and fourfold differences. Um, so this is just to establish in a very short period of time, we've seen huge variations in cancer risk that um, cannot possibly be explained by genetics. And so the big question is, what's causing all of these changes? And um, diet is obviously a very obvious place to go because diets have changed very much. But of course, we want rigorous scientific effort. Um, it's not necessarily the only factor, but it's probably one of those, and it's certainly one um, that we've studied quite a bit. So cancer isn't the only picture here, or the only um, outcome or health um, outcome in the story, and Richard touched on this too. Um, there's also uh, some of the cardiometabolic diseases, and again, um, this is data from the um, uh, WHO um, comparing changes in diabetes rates um, um, over the major WHO regions, and we see over um, between, say, the past 20 years, um, two and threefold differences in diabetes rates, again, couldn't possibly be caused by genetics, must be certain things in the environment changing all around the world that's causing these kinds of differences. Um, so this emphasizes a little bit more from the WHO, um, but um, they seem already convinced <laughs> a healthy diet, regular physical activity, maintaining a normal body weight, and avoiding tobacco use are ways to prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes. Then we have cardiovascular disease. Um, they're the leading cause of death globally, um, and um, very large numbers of people. It's responsible for 32% of all deaths, and um, over three quarters of these deaths take place in low and middle income countries. It's also a cause of uh, pre um, premature deaths. 
and we'll get to that in a second. But again, WHO says most cardiovascular diseases can be prevented by addressing behavioral risk factors such as tobacco use. Again, we see unhealthy diet and obesity, physical act inactivity, and harmful use of alcohol. And um, this is just to show a really uh, severe global disparity, which is um, cardiovascular disease um, incidence and mortality rates are generally going down around the world, which is good news. Um, but a disparity that's increasing at the same time is the proportion of people dying prematurely under the age of 70 from cardiovascular disease is happening very much disproportionately in low and middle income countries. And this gradient is like a 30 or 40 fold gradient. So the, in the red um, regions, and this is men and this is women, in the red and darker regions, there's a much more higher chance of premature death than, say, here in Europe, very low. We see in both um, the United States is a little bit in the middle, as Richard was pointing out. But um, in terms of a global disparity and kind of the right to life, we see that cardiovascular disease is really a big issue here. So um, I might say, you know, after seeing this and many, many other slides that could be shown for an entire talk or an entire course, you know, what could possibly be causing these huge changes in disease rates of an order of 10 or even 100 fold? A few strong risk factors and many weak risk factors. Obviously, cigarette smoking is part of the story, but it can't be the entire story. So it just leaves this big question, you know, what else could it be? Um, and um, cigarette smoking in terms of the residual confounding issue, which I'll get into, um, it's a weak and in the wrong direction premenopausally for breast cancer. It has a modest effect for colorectal cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, um, a little bit stronger, but still, it's not like uh, lung smoking and lung cancer. So um, in terms of this picture that we're showing, this huge international variation and in, you know, global mortality due to diabetes and cardiovascular disease, um, cigarette smoking, again, might be part of the story, but there's got to be other major changes in the environment, an environment very broadly defined to include diet, lifestyle, air pollution, and all the other things that could change very quickly in 20 or 40 years, um, as opposed to genes. Um, so um, the primary culprit um, that could possibly be explaining away the associations that have been reported um, relating diet to health in nutritional epidemiology is usually sort of a somewhat vague concept called healthy lifestyle. And not smoking cigarettes is a part of it. Um, but then the question is, can this healthy lifestyle, whatever these other things are, then could explain 40-fold differences or 10-fold differences? Um, are they the ones, are they the things that are explaining all these differences, even though we've never seen them in our data at that large magnitude? So healthy lifestyle, a healthy diet, regular physical activity, not smoking, moderate or no alcohol intake, absence of traumatic events. Um, high quality regular preventive health care, and maybe I'm missing something. Secondhand smoke, I think I actually missed, um, and maybe air pollution too. Um, and then what is healthy diet? Well, the WHO has defined that too, um, and, they, um, and they, talk about, um, um, they talk about healthy diet um, first related to breastfeeding, and then um, um, maintaining energy intake in relation to energy expenditure, um, holding down total fat intake is 30% of total energy intake, decreasing saturated fat intake, decreasing trans fat intake, um, limiting sugar intake, and um, keeping salt intake down. And that's um, sort of, you might say, the international consensus about uh, what we mean in general when we talk about a healthy diet. So. Um, establishing that, now we can move into a little bit more of the technical and statistical issues. So the first uh, thing, uh, the first issue is, well, to what extent could confounding explain, say, a particular uh, diet health association that's been reported? And I keep using this graphic because it's actually been well known since 1959 when Cornfield developed, uh, derived the formula to um, try to argue against the tobacco industry who was saying that cigarette smoking couldn't have been causing lung cancer. They thought it was some other unknown factors that were responsible for these large relative risks. We learned that there's um, bounds on how much a confounder can explain an observed relative risk. And there's been further developments in that area that I'm going to briefly touch on. 
So there's one first approach is um, sort of a more empirical approach um, where um, there can be proxies for a healthy lifestyle that can be um, adjusted for an analysis um, that may not even be actual risk factors themselves in a causal sense, but correlated with these unknown things that are causing 10 and 40 fold differences in international rates. Um, and some of them that have been uh, proposed have been sunscreen use, agreeing to be in a randomized clinical trial, adherence to placebo and or active regimen in an RCT, using a seatbelt, adherence to colorectal cancer or breast cancer screening guidelines, adherence to annual checkups. So people who do these things um, are likely leading healthy lifestyles in terms of these unknown um, confounders that are out there. Um, so there's some data on this, and um, there are um, these proxies do seem to have an effect. Um, here in one study, um, a sunscreen use was associated with a 50% reduction in vascular disease risk. In another study done by uh, Howard, Howard Sessu and colleagues at the Brigham, um, he reported a 36% reduction in cardiovascular mortality among physicians who agreed to be randomized, although uh, um, uh, compared to those who declined after controlling for many behavioral and clinical risk factors. And then adherence to a placebo regimen in a double-blinded trial of my myocardial infarction, infarction was associated with a 60% reduction in risk of mortality, uh, most likely due to other healthy lifestyles to which the adherence follow. Obviously, I guess the placebo, there was, this was a placebo. And then again, something similar has been seen where good adherers to treatment and placebo in essentially a null trial seem to have better outcomes than the bad adherers. Um, so uh, we did an analysis along these lines in the Nurses' Health Study and Health Professionals' Follow-Up Study. Um, I worked on this with other colleagues um, while I was still at Harvard here at the School of Public Health. And um, we looked at cardiovascular disease incidents. We looked at sunscreen use as the proxy for healthy lifestyle. And we controlled for all measured baseline and time varying determinants of cardiovascular risk. And the idea is that if sunscreen use is protective for cardiovascular risk, in the absence of any causal effect, it could be a proxy for healthy lifestyle. And then if adjusting for all the confounders that we've measured makes that healthy lifestyle effect go away, that would suggest that when we adjust for all the confounders in our standard analysis, we're adjusting for um, these um, kind of, uh, we're just essentially capturing all of the adjustment for healthy lifestyle. That's the idea here. And um, this is just a very long list of all the things we adjusted for and the categories. So you, they were baseline as well as time varying every two years. You can see the categories are very fine. We know that we have residual confounding when we use broad categories and when we tighten the categories, uh, the, con the control of confounding gets better and better. Um, and we did this both in health professionals and nurses, very similar covariates, but pretty much, you know, everything that we, we know about known or suspected risk factors for cardiovascular disease incidents were controlled for in a detailed way. And um, in, um, just to note that the prevalence of regular sunscreen use was 41% in health professionals and 25% in nurses. We'll get, that's important. We'll get back to that a little later. So this is a very busy slide that you probably, I'll just say the bottom line of this is that sunscreen use is moderately to weakly associated with other indicators of healthy lifestyle, such as body mass index, alcohol intake, uh, physical activity, and so forth. And then um, here is the actual analysis. So in, we have health professionals results here in these three columns, nurses in these three, and we see that uh, when we start out, let's say this is 75% uh, sunscreen use, um, it, we see a protective effect of 15%, and then we adjust, that's adjusting for age in five-year groups. Then we adjust for age in months, and it goes down to 0.84. Then we adjust for the main effects of all the both baseline covariates I showed on the previous slide, and it goes down to 0.96 already. It's no longer significant. And then we... Um, added the time-varying covariates, and it didn't change at all. It just stayed at 0.96. 
And then we allowed for uh, flexibly uh, selecting any two-way interactions after forcing main effects, just in case there's some nonlinearity that would be inducing residual confounding, and it got a little bit smaller to 0.98. And similarly, the same approach, the same uh, hierarchy of relative risks getting more and more to the null, suggesting there's no residual confounding due to healthy lifestyle related to sunscreen use um, in these data. So this could be repeated um, with other indicators of healthy lifestyle, and the data that we have um, would permit that for, say, regular mammography screening, regular colorectal cancer screening, regular checkups. And if there's anybody out here in the audience who would like to um, work with us to do this additional analysis, um, I think that would be very interesting and a nice contribution. So um, here I conclude appreciable residual confounding by healthy lifestyle in well annotated epi studies where risk factors that are potential confounders are repeatedly measured with high quality is unlikely. Now we'll move to a little bit more theoretical results. So um, we uh, most uh, probably everybody here who has some sort of background in training in epidemiology learned that bias due to confounding, including residual confounding, is li limited by the minimum of three factors. And I first learned this in reading Observation and Inference, which was a book written by Alec Walker and published in 1991 that's now out of print. Um, but the three factors are the strength of the association of the confounder with the outcome of interest, the strength of the association of the confounder with the exposure of interest, and the prevalence of the confounder. So even if the confounder has an, a relative risk of four with the outcome, if its association with the exposure is 1.5, that sharply limits how much bias can be due to um, residual confounding. And then if the confounder isn't that common, like healthy lifestyle, how common is it? Well, in the nurse's health study, sunscreen use was 25%. Um, that's to give you an idea. It's not necessarily a common exposure at all in our societies right now. So as this exposure prevalence gets smaller, bias goes to zero. As the correlation between the exposure and the confounder gets smaller, bias goes to zero. And as the uh, a, a relative risk of the confounder to the outcome goes to zero, bias goes to zero, no matter what the value of the other two parameters are. So it's the minimum of these things. It's not some average or maximum or compromise in any way. So many of you have learned about the E-value, which was published by Tyler Vanderweel of this department and Peter Ding in 2017. It's um, been a very widely used metric. I think the paper, this 2017 paper, has close to 2,000 citations already. And um, it's the descendant of early work that started with Cornfield in 1959 and um, was all, um, has um, been related to work by Bruss in 65, Schlesselman in 1978, and many others. And the E-value represents the minimum strength of association on the risk ratio scale that an unmeasured confounder would need to have with both, as I just said, the treatment outcome association uh, condition on the measure of uh, the treatment um, outcome association, I, there's a typo here, an exposure outcome association, an um, exposure treatment association conditional on the measured covariates to explain away the observed effect. And the E-value assumes the prevalence of the confounder is 50%, which is the value at which the confounding bias is at its maximum with respect to this factor. So the E-value itself will be an overestimate of the minimum value that the association of the confounder with the exposure or the confounder with the outcome has to be in order to explain away the observed association and exposure of interest. Um, and this is the formula. It's very simple, which makes it very nice, beautiful, and elegant. Um, and it's very general. It, it applies to all sorts of models, outcomes, and exposures. Um, so. Um, as I mentioned, I want to turn back to, for a minute, this issue of the confounder prevalence, which um, the E-value, as I mentioned, becomes an overestimate unless the confounder prevalence is, uh, or an underestimate, unless the confounder prevalence is 50. So if healthy lifestyle is this purputed uh, residual confounder, 
that has both caused these huge increases in international variations, not due to measured factors that we already know the relative risks of, um, then it better be very common or it's not going to really explain away these effects. So we looked at this question sort of indirectly. Um, and again, these are, there are many ways to look at these. So I'm just bringing out data that I know about or I've been connected to that seems to lend some information to this topic. So um, we looked at this in nurses and health professionals for six modifiable risk factors for colorectal cancer, body mass index, physical activity, folic acid intake, alcohol consumption, smoking before age 30, and red meat intake. And then we calculated a score that was the sum across the risk factors of the values of one to five for each one of these exposures. Well, guess how common it was for, for healthy lifestyle? Um, 18, this is among the person years of follow-up among the nearly 50,000 men in health professionals between 86 and 96. 18 had a risk score less than 14, 6% had a risk score um, less than, I mean, 6% had a risk score less than 11, and 3% had no risk factors at all. I mean, that's the real healthy lifestyle that, you know, maybe people had 100, 200 years ago. Um, and for, for those who had no risk factors, we estimated, we couldn't calculate it directly because there's too few of them, um, that the population attributable risk for colorectal cancer was 71%. Um, and then similar low proportions of people living healthy lifestyles in nurses uh, were found um, in a similar analysis. Uh, um, and, um, and this was, say, where 20% of nurses between 86 and 2010 um, had um, per their person years of experience corresponded to a risk score of 0 and 1, ranging from 0 to 6. And um, I'd like to say also that this work was actually led by Ed Giovannucci, who um, was looking at this more out of the interest of estimating population attributable risks as opposed to prevalences of healthy lifestyle. So maybe that's convincing enough um, to you all to say that, well, um, we have the E value, but without including um, the um, without including the, the fact that, um, we, uh, that um, the uh, purported residual unmeasured confounder um, is rare, relatively rare, uh, we may be, on, oh, we may be um, underestimating uh, what the um, E-value should be. So now there's a paper, um, Ludovic Trinkard et al., uh, in the American Journal of Epidemiology 2019. It did a comprehensive survey of 100 nutritional epi studies with significant findings. They also looked at environmental health um, studies as well, but I'm sticking purely to nutrition in this talk. And the median relative risk reported was 1.33, um, co corresponding to an E-value of 2. And so that means that if 50% of the population had an unhealthy lifestyle, and if unhealthy lifestyle increased the risk of outcomes by at least twofold after, don't forget these are residual uh, effects. We've already adjusted for everything measured, at least at baseline, if not also in a time-varying way, after adjusting for measured health, healthy lifestyle-related risk factors. And if those in the high-risk exposure group are twice as likely to also have an unhealthy lifestyle than those in the low-risk group after adjusting for the association, again, it's a residual correlation. It's not the crude as a correlation then the entire effect of the nutritional exposure would be due to residual confounding. So these are all the conditions we need, say, to explain away this 1.33. And so the authors concluded, I don't think they were fully taking into account the residual aspect of this. Um, they concluded that little to moderate unmeasured confounding could explain away most of the observed associations, which you might like very much, Richard. Um, but I don't agree with this. So I, I, the 50% of the population doesn't have, a, um, doesn't have an unhealthy lifestyle. It's much higher. Um, and these things um, translate to protective risk factors and so forth. So um, we could say if 50% of the population had a healthy lifestyle, let's just look at it that way. Um, and then if unhealthy life, anyway, I think I said all of this. And so the main point is that um, if we feel that this too, like, you know, um, kind of sings the uh, death knell for nutritional epi studies, I feel like this prevalence of 
um, un a healthy lifestyle has not been fully considered, and um, the fact that we're talking about residual associations is not fully appreciated either. So I went in, I used Schleselman's formula. This is it, it's from the 1979 paper, um, and it's equivalent to the E-value formula when you have a binary outcome, confounder, and exposure, when there's no effect modification, and when the confounder, um, um, it, no, that's wrong, and it shouldn't say when the confounder prevalence is 50%. That's a mistake. That's a really major mistake. So it just ends when there is no effect modification. And um, we can use this expression to solve for the value that would give a, an, yield the relative risk observed for a given um, confounder prevalence, and then explore the impact of the rare confounder prevalences. And so we have a graph right here that plots this out. So on the y-axis is the E-value, and then on the x-axis is the confounder prevalence. So when it's 50%, this is like the 1.35, the blue, if you take it over, it's going to be almost 2. That's consistent with what was published in the paper I just showed you that did the survey. Um, but if we take the 1.35 and we say, well, healthy lifestyle is only about 10% in the population, now we need um, relative risks of like 3.2 to explain away observed associations. And um, maybe if it's 20%, then it's about 2.5, and so on, for what um, the observed associations are. So um, here, I don't know how I'm doing on time, Bert. How am I doing? You're doing very well. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so now I've established that uh, very strong changes in the distribution of risk factors must be responsible for variations across space and time and chronic disease rates, and that there are tight theoretical bounds on bias due to residual confounding makes it implausible that residual confounding could explain away most diet disease associations. And then empirical evidence shows that a plausible surrogate for residual confounding by healthy lifestyle has no effect on cardiovascular disease incidence, suggesting little to no residual confounding by lifestyle. So now we'll move on to what I consider to be the solution, which also overlaps a little bit with Richard's talk. So here we have the graphic where the boundlessness of measurement error, because um, there is no bounds on measurement error like there are with confounding. So the more measurement error you have, the closer and closer the bias will be towards the null of a relative risk, a risk difference, or whatever parameter you're interested in. And similarly, let's say if we have a relative risk of two, and the correlations, Richard's, was talking about are around 10%, that would lead to a true relative risk of 1,000. So we say, you know, adjusting for measurement error has a very big impact on um, our estimates of observed associations. Um, and luckily, there are robust methods and software available to correct for this bias in both exposures of interest and potential confounders simultaneously, empirically eliminating the residual confounding issue. And in order to do that, we need validation or reliability data, and there's high-quality validation reliability data available across a range of chronic disease risk factors, permitting empirical adjustment to eliminate this source of bias. So this is, um, you know, an old, this is from Armstrong Wright and Sirachi's Principle of Exposure Measurement book from 1992, and it just shows if the true odds ratio is 1.9, and then here we have the same correlation that Richard was talking about. He was calling it R squared, and I'm using the Greek letter rho. So depending on what that was, this is the, um, what the true odds ratio would look like for each of these. And it just establishes um, a point, you know, the point through this example table that uh, a measurement error bias is towards the null. Um, so there are uh, common approaches to the measurement error problem in um, um, epidemiology, uh, sensitivity analysis. So, um, as Richard said, we can say that most, um, the, the, the S, if, if uh, all other things being equal, um, that uh, any estimated diet health association is probably, is an underestimate of what its true association is, because we know dietary variables are measured with moderate measurement error. Um, and so we can use those kinds of arguments to interpret results. Um, another approach is validating the exposure measurements. So there are lots of validation studies. I'm going to get to that in a second. And um, sometimes people will say, well, the um, 
the measure we're using um, is valid because it had a significant p-value, say the correlation between it and the better measure, gold standard, alloyed gold standard, was significant, which of course is a function of sample size as much as it's the strength of the association. Um, and the third method, which is the one I really um, have spent a lot of my own time working on, and as well as others, is quantitative correction of effect estimates. And in order to do that, we need to uh, do some things at the study design level, because we need the main study, which is the standard study that's, that we have in epidemiology, and then a reliability or validation study. And then in analysis, we use methods to empirically adjust for measurement error um, or misclassification. Um, so a validation study would, an internal validation study would have in addition to X, the gold standard or alloy gold standard. It would have the usual measure that would be done in the main study as well as the outcome. And in an external validation study, we just have um, the usual exposure measure and then the, um, and then the true exposure measure or the uh, alloy gold standard exposure measure. And usually uh, we don't need, if we have say, 100,000 nurses, we don't need 100,000. Um, we don't need to validate all 100,000. We can really get, um, do a very good job. Well, we had for many years around 200 or less. And now with the lifestyle validation studies, we have 800 to 1,000, which is a big improvement. So um, you know, just to say a little bit about how much measurement error there is in dietary variables from uh, Walter's 1985 paper on the validating the food frequency questionnaire through weighed 28 days of weighed and measured food records. Alcohol is very well measured, a correlation of 0.85. Calories from fat or fat density, uh, correlation of 0.52. And um, correlations for basically pretty much any hypothesized nutrient that could, or food that could have an effect on health. We know something about these correlations from empirical data. So this is a slide for dramatic effect. There are hundreds of validation and reliability studies that are available and have been published. And um, this is, you know, many pages of them. Just to give you an idea, like it, there's no excuse to say there's, there isn't the data to do this. The data are out there um, pretty much for anything you could think of. So we'd say with these validation or reliability data, hundreds of publications provide a robust, flexible set of methods to empirically correct for measurement error in exposures of interest and confounders simultaneously, which is a really important point. Well, it's not just to help adjust the point estimate for the exposure. It take, these methods take into account um, the covariates in the model, the dietary covariates, other covariates, uh, what their um, correlations are with each other, what the correlations are with their errors, and then adjust through sort of vector matrix methods and other methods takes all of that into account to produce uh, estimates that are doing this simultaneous correction. So there are three key papers from our group that um, had um, um, proposed methods for this, and they're here. Um, they've had about 1,100 citations, and they're probably the most widely used in practice for measurement error, and I did notice that 73% of the citations were in non-statistical journals, which makes me very happy because it makes me think people are actually using the methods rather than writing more statistics papers about them. Um, and then there's other work by us and many other people on survival data analysis, population attributable risks, principles of modeling, design of studies, misclassification. Again, you can't use these methods if you don't have validation data, but there's a lot of validation data that you can use. Um, and so we assume this generalized linear measurement error model where the, um, where the uh, gold standard or allied gold standard follows this linear model and this can be empirically verified in data. It fits very well in a lot of the nutritional data we've looked at here as well as in air pollution data. Um, but if it didn't fit, then some of these methods, at least the methods of these three papers, may not um, be the best choice. There's other options. Um, and then the classical measurement error model, which was the one Richard was considering, where you have a person has an underlying true blood pressure, and then there's just some random noise due to daily, weekly, et cetera, variation. And then that's what, what we observe is the true measure plus the noise. That's a classical additive measurement error model. And at least under normality, um, you can go from that model to this model. So it covers that model. 
And so just very quickly, you know, we have methods basically to correct jointly in a multivariate manner for measurement error in both dietary exposures of interest and confounders given validation data and reliability data. And um, this is one of the macros that we've developed. I just want to say it's this easy. This is the line of code that will produce the full multivariate uh, measurement error correction. And this um, macro is available internally um, at the Channing Lab and also on my website at Yale. It's publicly available. And this is sort of what it reproduces. So this is from one of our early papers where we're simultaneously adjusting for error in fat, total fat intake, energy intake, and alcohol intake in relation to breast cancer incidence. And we get, um, these would be the uncorrected odds ratios and their confidence intervals and p-values. And then this is the corrected. So um, this, the point of this was really um, that correcting for measurement error in this multivariate way didn't um, change uh, the, the estimated effect of dietary fat on breast cancer, which was essentially no. There's a p-value here. Um, energy intake, this is a way of adjust. One of the uh, three ways of adjusting for energy intake is putting energy into the model directly. You can also calculate nutrient densities. And then alcohol intake, we've kind of, it's been pretty reliably shown as a risk factor for breast cancer, but it's measured well. And so it only slightly was de-attenuated when we did this multivariate adjustment. And then the other thing that's interesting is this multivariate adjustment doesn't just uh, re-estimate the values of the variables measured with error, it also has an impact on the variables measured without error, age, um, that are correlated with the variables measured with error. So it's not like a big difference here, but you can see like the effect of, um, say, um, those being uh, 40 to f under 45, uh, when, well, that didn't, that's not a good one. Let's say 45 to under 50 was 2.29, but then after we corrected for measurement error, it went to 2.14. But the point of this is, uh, theoretically, when you have a multivariable model and you have measurement error in, one, in even one covariate that's correlated with other covariates not measured with error, when you do this multivariate adjustment, you're going to see changes in all the variables in the model. At, uh, um, we also, I want to say, because survival analysis is an important uh, tool for uh, the analysis of um, epidemiologic um, prospective cohort studies. So we also have this macro also available at the Channing and on my website at Yale to correct point and interval estimates of relative risk for measurement error and survival data analysis. And we can handle, because in a prospective cohort, the exposure, it's a complex uh, time varying variable and there's many ways to model it. And we often don't know what the right answer is, but this will handle baseline exposure, a simple update, a cumulative average, and a cumulative total. So um, now I've established bias due to measurement error has no bounds, but robust methods and software exist to correct for bias and exposures of interest and potential confounders. And that high va quality validation and reliability data are uh, available across a range of chronic disease risk factors permitting empirical adjustment to eliminate this source of uncertainty. So let's look a little bit about, um, um, oh, okay. Ooh. Okay, well then in one minute, what I'm gonna say is, um, so I also look, we talked about measurement error and dietary variables, but there, uh, some of these healthy lifestyle variables um, are non-dietary and they can also, if, if there's error in them, we can also uh, induce residual confounding. So BMI, as Richard mentioned, it's measured very well. Um, other dietary factors we have really good validation data for. Alcohol intake, we have good validation data for. The correlation is around 0.5. Physical activity, we have really good um, uh, validation data for, and the correlation is about 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. So here, uh, I think the really challenging one is smoking, um, where it's a moderate risk factor for many cancers, but not breast, obviously very strong for lung, and a moderate risk factor for CV, CVD and type 2 diabetes. And I looked into this a little bit to prepare for this talk, and um, long-term, um, measurements of long-term smoking seem to be, are, is very difficult to validate, and I found a few studies about this, um, and, um, you know, it wasn't the sensitivities of just smoking, not smoking, without even talking about pack years, and the sensitivities and specificities vary a lot from study to study, um, and, um, and they, um, some of them are not good at all, um, but another interesting point is 
um, because we've, uh, there's some talk of using the non-smoker strata as, as a sort of unconfounded strata. Um, there's um, data showing comparing people who report their smoking prevalence on um, representative national surveys, the National Health Information Survey and another one, compared to uh, tobacco consumption data in the United States at the same time. And it looks like um, smoking um, is being underestimated by around 25% to a third, um, according if you compare the consumption data. So I'm not sure that never smokers are actually never smokers, um, at least if you believe these data. But um, maybe smoking is something we need to do more work on. Um, I won't go into I looked at trauma. There's good data on that. Uh, regular preventive high-quality health care. There's good data on that. Um, I had um, hoped to make a comment about trials, and I'll just make it very briefly, which is that trials um, are not immune to these issues because especially in trials of prolonged um, doses of a particular thing, like a diet or a vitamin, um, because people have to keep taking them over and over again for years, and there seems there could be a lot of non-adherence, both random non-adherence, which would bias towards the null, um, but still leave the p-value intact, and if the non-adherence is non-random, meaning that it's associated with risk factors for the outcome that aren't adjusted in the analysis, then even the p-value will be invalid. And, it could, and also the estimated effects could be in other directions. So um, my last point was I was going to say, where do we go from here? I'll just say for me, the diet health associations are so strong that I've moved on to, the impl to implementation research to translate the knowledge already in place to improve public health, starting with reduction of cardiometabolic risk, and hopefully cancer will follow. We all know that that would take longer. And so I was going to go over a study that I um, um, have been working on that I'm going to skip that looked very well, looked like it was doing very well in even over in under six months in six months, um, changing what's being offered in some workplace cafeterias in Nepal. Blood pressure was significantly reduced by three millimeters of mercury. And by taking all 16 classes of the diabetes prevention program about healthy lifestyles, um, a predicted five millimeters mercury of blood pressure would have been attained. So um, I will just say thank you to Bert, our department chair, Coppelia, for organizing the event, all my amazing colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health over the years, Yale for making it possible for me to move to the translation space, my two daughters, and my partner. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very, very much, Donna. We go to our final presentation, Dr. Walter Willett, Professor of Nutrition and Epidemiology in both of the departments here at the Harvard School of Public Health. I don't think he needs much introduction, has been worked very much on um, the nurses, uh, many methodological innovations in uh, nutritional epidemiology. And Walt, you will talk about diet and disease, remembering Bradford Hill. And Bradford Hill was a Cutter lecturer in 1953, I remember. Yeah? Please go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bert. Uh, So we've heard a lot about some of the theoretical statistical issues involved in dealing with measurement error and control for confounding. Can you hear me all right? OK. Thank you. Uh, so I will give a, a little more focus on actual application and dealing with some of these issues in a practical sense. Uh, to go back in time like Donna did, I think it is really important to remember where we got started in this business, and a lot of it what began with these international correlations. Actually, Armstrong and Dahl, back in 1975, and others pointed out these very strong correlations between uh, various aspects of diet, but especially fats and oils, and risk of multiple cancers, but in particular, breast cancer uh, uh, correlations with incidence 0 0.63, mortality 0 0.80. And actually, on pretty much not much more than this evidence, dietary guidelines across the United States and across the world emphasized reducing fat in the diet. The other data they had was pretty limited. 
1981, based on, a, to a large extent on this kind of data, uh, Sir Richard and uh, Dahl and Sir Richard Pito uh, published this paper in uh, the uh, Journal of the National Cancer Institute. And they suggested that diet might be responsible for 35% of total cancer incidence, actually a little bit higher than smoking that got a lot of attention, but appropriately they expressed a lot of uncertainty about that magnitude of the effects of diet and cancer. And it, we were looking at that data around this time and realized that these ecological correlations were potentially very much confounded and we needed more detailed studies. So uh, uh, actually uh, the nurse's health study had begun uh, to a large extent with input from uh, Richard uh, working with Frank Spicer uh, in Oxford as uh, Frank Spicer was there on a, a sabbatical. Uh, and at that time was doctors' wives, but it morphed into the nurse's health study. I joined the next year and was looking at these data uh, and Brian McMahon pointed me to that data as well, that the diet might be an important cause of breast cancer, but it, we clearly needed more detailed studies than these ecological studies. So after some pilot work, we started collecting diet in 1980 using a structured questionnaire that looked like it was probably going to work reasonably well. And basically over time, we've been uh, collecting diet repeatedly after four-year intervals, uh, except just for some funding reasons, there was a, a double uh, every two years here. Uh, but importantly, we knew there was a lot of skepticism about how well we could measure diet and built into our cohort studies these validation calibration studies that Donna talked about, uh, first in the nurse's health study in 1980, then repeated in 86, and then with about, it really cost about $15 million uh, uh, of money in uh, uh, 1910 and, and uh, excuse me, 2010 and 2008 uh, in the health professions follow-up study. Uh, so we have three validation studies there, two in the nurses in the health professions follow-up study, and then Nurses' Health Study 2 was part of the Nurses' Health Study 2008-2010 uh, uh, validation studies. And th that's been really important to have those because it allowed us to address a lot of questions and concerns. After four years of follow-up in the Nurses' Health Study where diet and breast, uh, dietary fat and breast cancer was the main hypothesis, we had uh, 601 cases and contrary to the hypothesis, there was a slight inverse association, not a positive association. And that set off a storm because there was so much belief, recommendations across the world were based on dietary fat. Uh, there had to be a reason why we missed that uh, a, a very important causal relationship. And of course, the obvious question was, could we measure diet well enough to uh, detect an important association? And that's where the validation studies came in uh, to be to be very important because it's it's true if we did, don't measure something we won't find an association. Uh, interestingly, the upper confidence bound there was 1.09 that from the uh, ecological data you would have predicted 1.40 something in that ballpark. So we quite the confidence intervals were uh, quite a bit tighter than the prediction. So we've there's as Donna pointed out lots of data lots of publications from the validation studies, but uh, it, there was a special opportunity in the nurses' health study because about half of the people in the eight, 1980 and 86 diet uh, validation studies were the same women. And therefore, we could look at, uh, as the gold standard, weighed diet records over a six-year uh, interval of time. And for multiple reasons, weighed diet records are probably the best gold standard. and. Uh, because we're really, even if we measure one year perfectly, that's not going to represent long-term intake perfectly. So we started off with just our 1980 questionnaire, looking at the average of six years, and then de-attenuated for with, uh, within year variability. That, those are the numbers in parentheses here. Uh, the corrected correlation was 0 0.57 for total fat, and most of the emphasis was actually on saturated fat, where we do even a little bit better, corrected up to 0 0.70. And uh, uh, looking at combinations then, average of three food frequency questionnaires over this period, because we have these repeated questionnaires, and the de-attenuated diet records, we were getting quite high correlations 
for validity over a six year or so period of time, 0.83 and 0.95. Maybe this is a little on the high side, but that's what the numbers were showing. So based on this, it seemed like we weren't missing a lot of uh, variability and true intake with our questionnaires. And then as Donna showed, we with uh, Bernie Rosner have actually developed the statistical methods to take into account errors in both the primary exposure, total fat, or saturated fat in this example, and errors in, confound in the potential confounders here. So Donna showed a, another is, uh, analysis similar to this, where the observed uh, odds ratio was 0 0.94, with the attenuation uh, and me for measurement error would be 0 0.84, uh, go away from the null. But here, where you're close to the, you're seeing basically something close to the null, the real issue is the confidence interval and taking into account the measurement error uh, in calculating the confidence interval. We're still easily uh, excluding the 1.40 that uh, ecological data predicted. And alcohol went up here, as you can see, from 1.33 to uh, uh, 1.62, uh, that's for an interval of uh, 25 grams of alcohol intake, uh, about two drinks a day. So uh, that was uh, still controversial, and David Hunter uh, with us started the uh, pooling project of cohort studies. Uh, this is our first publication from that, 1996. There were about seven studies, about 5,000 incident cases of breast cancer, so we had a lot more power, and we could look at more extreme categories of fat intake. And here again, the issue was uh, uh, the ability to detect, uh, detect associations. And here with a large number of cases still flat until you got, people kept saying, well, you need to look lower and lower to pick up the low fat benefit. And at the low fat benefit, if anything, there was an uh, increase. And actually these people look metabolically in bad shape with a very low fat intake, high carbohydrate intake. Also, we've been able to revisit this issue time and time again in the cohorts. This is uh, after 20 years of follow-up. And here we could look at latency. And that's really important for cancer because we know that if you have an exposure now, it doesn't necessarily cause cancer in the next uh, five years or 10 years or even 20 years, it's sometimes uh, even greater latencies. So we could look out here with 16 to 20 years of latency, still very null. And that's basically the picture that we've continued to see. Of course, this issue got so much attention, there was a special act of Congress that funded the Women's Health Initiative to look at this very hypothesis of whether reduction in fat intake would reduce risk of breast cancer. And so after billions of dollars in, in this trial, uh, this is what they found, uh, a, a hazard ratio of 0 0.91, but not significant. Uh, there was a hint maybe of a little benefit there of low fat, but some of that could have been to some early uh, reduction in body weight. We know that that happens on any diet. If you intensively get people to adhere to a diet, they lose a couple kilograms. And that probably explained, could have explained a little bit of this, but the investigator said, well, if we just wait, have a couple more years of follow-up, we'll see the benefit uh, uh, more clearly. Actually, it flipped around and it was dead now with a couple more years of follow-up. The one other good study, longer duration, uh, was conducted in Canada by Norm Boyd, and they found an almost significant association, but in the opposite direction. So uh, clearly, if you put the data together, it's, it's very, very null. Although uh, Ross Prentice still oh. wants to believe there's a, a benefit of fat reduction here, even after billions of dollars of investment in this study. Uh, so more recently, we've had the lifestyle validation study, which enabled us to build in many biomarkers of diet as well. It added another dimension. It's been very useful. And uh, this is uh, the basic study design is like what our earlier study designs. Uh, people initially filled out the food frequency questionnaire. And then after a year, the second food frequency questionnaire, which really asked about this year, but we were concerned about people becoming sensitized by the first questionnaire and the recording of diet. So in fact, we get almost the same correlations with these two questionnaires. So that was important to uh, be careful that we'd be sure we were not really sensitizing our people by having them record their intakes. And uh, again, this uh, allowed us to use multiple methods. Our gold standard, uh, two weeks of weighed what diet records distributed by random, more or less, over the year, four 24-hour recalls of diet, and then 
quite a few biomarkers, doubly labeled water for energy adjustment, 24-hour urines, and also two fasting blood samples. So with the repeated measures, we could correct for within person variability in the biomarkers as well. And uh, again, lots and lots of data from this. I can only give you a sample here. Uh, one of the nice things that this enabled us to do with these re many repeated measurements and types of different measurements was use the method of triads to look at what we would really like to know, this latent variable, true folate intake. And uh, many of you, but not many epidemiologists, actually seem to be aware. Uh, Ole Mietner pointed this out to me to long ago. If you have uh, three measures of a variable, with, and assuming there's no correlated errors, and this probably is reasonable assumption, but uh, that's good to keep in mind, then with this triangle, you can and the correlations between the three, you can estimate the correlation of any one of them with true intake. And that's what we really want to know. And so uh, here, this is using folate. Uh, again, seven-day diet record. That has the best correlation. Uh, the biomarker, 0.75, even though it's a biomarker, it's got its own set of errors. And then the food frequency questionnaire, uh, not quite as good as the seven-day diet record, but actually pretty remarkably good. And that's just for one assessment of diet. And the repeated measurements are indeed very important. Uh, this is a study done, uh, uh, published by Daniel Wong in our group looking at dietary fat uh, and types of fat in relation to uh, total mortality. Uh, this combined our cohorts of men and women, about 130,000 people, about 30 years of follow-up, about 30,000 died during this period. So we, the confidence intervals around these lines are very tight. And uh, this is each type of fat compared with the same number of calories from carbohydrate. Uh, as we uh, expected, there was a very strong associated with association with trans fat. Fortunately, that's illegal now in the United States. Uh, uh, modest, fairly weak association with saturated fat, but highly significant. Inverse association with monounsaturated fat and very strong inverse association with polyunsaturated fat, which we've seen repeatedly over time. This is really strongly protective for cardiovascular disease and other outcomes as well. Uh, but if we only had the baseline measurement, that was using what we call cumulative update, the re uh, average of all repeated measurements up to the beginning of a two-year follow-up interval. That's our cumulative update measurement. Uh, and as we showed earlier in the validation study, those repeated measurements really do help improve validity. But uh, this, is, so this is what we would have seen if we only had the baseline measurement. It missed trans fat entirely. There it is right there, totally flat, nothing. Uh, monounsaturated fat in the wrong direction because actually the sources changed over the period of follow-up. Uh, saturated fat basically would have missed that entirely. And we would have picked up a sort of weak association with polyunsaturated fat, but you could have said, well, maybe it's just due to some residual confounding. Uh, uh, more recently, uh, Zhao Gu here has, uh, and this is now published, uh, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, that's right here, uh, looked at risk of red meat and type 2 diabetes risk. This is with the cohorts combined, about 23,000 incident cases of type 2 diabetes. And uh, this, uh, there, it's not quite as bad as, sat as uh, types of fat. This is with a baseline measurement only, and this was, is with the cumulative average of, of uh, uh, red meat consumption. So you miss a huge part of the association if you just have baseline measurement alone. Uh, but we have corrected using a, a little bit of an extension of what Donna described, regression calibration. Uh, and this is really the first time we did that, regression com calibration in combination with repeated measurements of diet. Uh, this is what we saw with the repeated measurements with the regression calibration, uh, a further correcting uh, uh, for that averaging in uh, provides a lot more information, but uh, there's still error. And so this provides the additional correction using regression calibration. This is total red meat, processed red meat, and unprocessed red meat. The, the calibration uh, adds some uh, additional benefit. But uh, as I mentioned, although uh, the ability to detect associations because of uh, especially the not seeing the widely believed association or effects of dietary fat on many on points. There, the attention in nutrition and epidemiology has mainly been on, are you, do you have enough validity to, to detect an association? 
But from the beginning, of course, we've been concerned about residual compounding that Richard has talked about appropriately. And of course, all epidemiologists are concerned about that. And uh, that does depend on the ability to measure the confounding variable or, and or correct for the confounding effect. So I'll talk about that some more. This is another paper uh, Richard published uh, here in 1981. Can dietary beta carotene materially reduce human cancer rates? And he started off, uh, human cancer risks are inversely correlated with blood retinol and dietary beta carotene. Uh, which is uh, interesting that we actually dismissed this shortly after Richard's publication with a paper in the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine that uh, that has now was clearly the problem a problem of reverse causation, uh, where the, even the biomarkers can be affected by uh, pre-diagnostic endpoints, uh, uh, but and also the uh, cancer risk uh, uh, with dietary beta carotene. You go back, I think the seminal paper that Richard had available that time in the New England Journal of Medicine had, had I think, 22 cases of lung cancer, which is sort of laughable at this, at this point in time. That, I mean, it, 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 but this was a reasonable hypothesis, and, and a lot of people thought it was reasonable. And uh, he went on to say if uh, beta carotene is truly protected, which could be tested by controlled trials, there are a number of uh, mechanisms. And actually, this resulted in 30 randomized trials, I think I, I calculated at one point in time, including adding beta carotene as a component in the physician's health study. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to provide Richard with better data at that time, but in the pooling project, we were able <coughs> to, some years later, look at uh, beta, beta carotene intake and risk of lung cancer, which was the driving association for the, uh, the belief or the hypothesis that beta carotene might be beneficial. And in the age-adjusted analysis, this is sort of worst-case scenario for confounding. And uh, there was a 0.65 relative risk here for beta carotene and risk of lung cancer, wildly significant in the uh, now over 3,000 cases compared to 22 cases early on. And uh, but and there we were very concerned about confounding by tobacco smoking because it's lung cancer, and. And so we adjusted very carefully. Actually, David Hunter was the senior author, I think, in this paper. And uh, adjusting carefully for categories of tobacco and also adjusting simultaneously for factors to take into account duration, we were able, we, the relative risk came out to be 0.98, which really shows that the careful adjustment in this worst case scenario, you can get back to something that is not really uh, appreciably confounded here. Uh, so. It, I think we wouldn't have launched those 30 studies had we seen that data, uh, but we just didn't have that data uh, early on. Uh, another worst case scenario here, coffee and lung cancer. And I mentioned this to make the case that even careful adjustment w uh, is not necessarily going to be adequate if you only have the baseline measurement alone. So this is part of a, a big consortium to look at coffee consumption in lung cancer. It was published in 2021. And uh, the, uh, th these are data from the nurses' health study part of it. Uh, but uh, essentially, looking at baseline only is very, this is what was seen in the total consortium as well. The, the, uh, uh, in the age-adjusted analysis, there was a f about a 4.5-fold increase in risk of lung cancer. And you could just imagine every uh, newspaper and uh, TV talk show in the country would be featuring coffee causes lung cancer. And uh, that was pretty worrisome to me. Uh, after adjustment, uh, pretty carefully, uh, it, although many cohorts didn't have the ideal adjustment, the relative risk in the co consortium went down to 1.40, something close to 1.4. Uh, but that had me quite worried because we, I, there was this big reduction, and as Richard said, we should be appropriately concerned about residual confounding here, and especially because we know and we've seen earlier that people who drink coffee are less likely to, in the future, stop smoking than non-coffee drinkers. There's probably some, maybe even genetic uh, predisposition to addiction here, uh, or that it may not be genetic, but uh, or addictive personalities for other reasons. <coughs> And so we did have in our cohort data the ability to use the repeated measurements of both exposure and uh, to coffee and uh, 
tobacco smoking information over time. So in, in our analysis, it's in the appendix in, in the consortium, uh, it went from in the top category 4.53 with the uh, careful adjustment plus the repeated measurements over time we were able to uh, completely control for the effects, the confounding effects of smoking. So it, uh, this residual confounding is real, but it's not an intractable problem. If we're careful and do really best quality epidemiology, we can control even in that worst case scenario. For, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. We've looked at this issue in a more recent analysis. It's not yet published by Hyu Wang. And uh, this is uh, a, a looking at this issue of residual confounding by uh, socioeconomic status, the kind of uh, variable that, uh, that Richard was concerned about here. So we're, we're using our dietary quality score here, the alternative healthy in, in eating index. And uh, we have a quite good variable now for neighborhood socioeconomic status. It's based on geocoded. This is in composite of a number of different variables of neighborhood income, education, those kinds of things that give quite a good measure. And it does uh, predict uh, mortality and other outcomes, although, although modestly. Uh, and uh, we do want to keep in mind that one of the good things about what Richard Dahl and, and uh, Richard Pito and Frank Spicer uh, did in, in selecting this uh, cohort of health professionals, we restricted socioeconomic status quite a bit by choosing health professionals, but there's still some variability, and it does uh, in our SES variables and the nurses, because depending partly on who they marry. And they, uh, in the full model, the relative risk was uh, 0.83. If then we remove neighborhood SES, there's essentially no change, so it's really, there's not going to be residual confounding, because it's not a confounder. Then we have in the, the personal predictors of income and education. Still, no effect. So there's not going to be residual confounding. Uh, alcohol remove, uh, BMI remove. There's some, definitely smoking is still the most important confounder. And they're all putting everything else and a few other variables. And we do get down to 0 0.62. So it does make the point that, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the neighborhood SES score mostly goes away when you adjust for the lifestyle variable. So it's not that big, especially for incidents, not quite so much for mortality. Now, I want to show pretty quickly here um, our, some new analyses. Uh, this is based on the composite diet quality scores, which are, not surprisingly, usually more robust and stronger than individual food items. The, this is uh, one of the seminal papers here was with Dimitri Trikopoulos, another uh, Cutter lecturer, and his wife, Antonia, who's still a close colleague. And uh, there, with this Mediterranean diet score in the age-adjusted model, uh, 0.79. Interestingly, in the fully adjusted model, it got a little stronger. It was a Mediterranean diet was a diet of poor rural people at that time. Um, and many other, this has been reproduced time and time in other populations. It's very robust inverse association. And here in this example, we do have one of the very few randomized trials that has been able to look at a total uh, a major dietary variable with good adherence. This is the Predimed study, familiar to many of you, about a 30% reduction with a Mediterranean diet with added nuts or with added extra virgin olive oil. So we know that this is causal, and there's uh, lots of uh, other sub-studies looking at in, uh, other clinical and intermediate risk factors as well. So more recently, we've created the Planetary Health Dietary Index to look at uh, how that relates to total mortality. This is an in dietary quality score to measure adherence to our Eat Lancet planetary health diet, taking into account both health effects and environmental effects. This is across deciles and, and women in our cohorts, very strong, about 30% lower risk in the upper uh, category here. And this is taking into account neighborhood um, SES and uh, other covariates uh, as well. Uh, this is total mortality in uh, men, basically same association, about a 30% lower incidence. Uh, interestingly enough, it's inversely related to all the major categories of uh, death except in um, men, infectious disease, but very wide confidence interval there. Same thing in women, uh, uh, and including, interestingly, respiratory disease. And we've been seeing that from incidents for quite a while. 
And what's uh, important here, of course, is never smokers, as uh, Richard pointed out here. And the association is very similar, actually, uh, to the total. The total, it, this is for a 20-point increment. It was 0.83. It's 0.86 in never smokers. So we've dealt with smoking pretty well there. And quite interestingly, this is almost a side uh, interest here. If you do look at uh, respiratory mortality, uh, it's also very strongly inverse still in the never smokers. Uh, importantly, we're also able to look at uh, environmental impacts here. Uh, and uh, just top quintile of that score compared to the bottom quintile, about a 29% lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so that's really important given all the issues of, around global climate change. Uh, about a 21% lower fertilizer use, about a 51% lower cropland use, which is hugely as important. We don't need to be chopping down the Amazon and plowing up the prairies around the world. So to conclude, the validity of current dietary assessments is actually quite good for many aspects of diet. Repeated measures can be, I really think, are important. Uh, calibration can also be very useful as well. Uh, control of confounding by smoking and SES, especially with repeated measurements, can be adequate, but you really do have to have high quality data. Residual confounding is something we, we keep, need to keep in mind all the time. Uh, but uh, also confounding by other constituents of foods can sometimes be intractable. If we're really trying to understand what it is in nuts that's beneficial, that's, like a, lot, that's a lot tougher. Uh, but also to, uh, in my reference back to Bradford Hill, uh, we also need to look at our epidemiologic in the context of other data as well. And I think, as Richard said, if we have the combination of randomized trials showing impacts on effects of diet, say red meat, on LDL cholesterol or blood pressure in combination with the epidemiologic data, that's where we really have strong evidence and can lead us to a high certainty about causality. So uh, that's uh, basically my uh, conclusion here. And um, thank you very much, Bert, for getting us together in another great Cutter lecture. Uh, thank you also, Richard, for coming over, because as you heard, he was really instrumental in getting the nursing health study started. Actually, uh, I think I remember that he wrote a promotion letter for me. You may regret that now, but anyway, <laughs> thank you, Richard. <laughs>